processes, about legals and stuff like that. The problem is, in the most of the acquisitions, the technical aspects are not part of that. So, hard and software, most of the time, it's the real asset, at least of the companies that we buy. We buy a lot of technology companies, so the assets are not their contracts or stuff like that. It's their code, it's their application, and it's their knowledge. And it's nothing that is normally typically um, evaluated in normal due diligences. So the problem with software or technology um, in general, it, it's not so easy to evaluate. There is no real method that you say, okay, um, this kind of software has a value of this. Um, software will fail, software, there's no measurement that you say, okay, the software has a value of that. There's no way of, um, of touching a software. So most of the people have a lot of problems assessing um, them. The second aspect of that, why it's really complex, is software typically is an, yeah, is, it is an ecosystem. You have a lot of systems, you have a lot of connection, interaction um, with the systems, with the technology in general, so you can't assess it by itself. And we um, see a lot of connected worlds, so normally your at least new applications has a connection to the internet, has mobile aspects, has cloud aspects and stuff like that. So what's the case with due diligence in real? This is the real challenge that we have by doing technical due diligence. So normally the mission that we have is we take a look at the picture and we have to assess it. We only get a small view, so we can compare it by the challenge to, to tell the height of the building um, only by looking at the picture. And if that's too difficult, um, tell the, the weight of the of the picture or the weight of the uh, of the building, that's a real um, what you have to do. And so, what's our job in technical due diligence? Our job is to assess the complexity, not only the complexity of the software by itself, but also the complexity of adding new functionalities. So maybe they have a limited business case, but you have to extend it. So complexity of changes of the code, the processes, how much do they scale? So most of the time they are small startups, so their processes work very well for a limited amount of customers. But the moment that you scale it inside a larger corporation, for example, manual processes won't work any longer. So you also have to keep in mind how does their business and their operation will scale on, on larger side. What's about maintaining their code, future developments, how good is the, the security? So most of the time security assessments also not typically that part of due diligence. Know-how, is there know-how in-sourced, is there know-how outsourced, is the know-how focused only on one person and what will happen if the person won't jump in inside a new company? What's about third-party code? So most of the time, what we see when we make due diligence is that they have a really yeah, creative way of thinking about um, third-party license. And so open source means you can use it anyway. That's their definition. So it's no problem to use that inside their code. Um, <clears throat> what's about integration and openness? Can you integrate their ecosystem in your environment? Have they used standards that you can extend in a really um, easy manner. So that's all our goals that you have to also look at the, them if you make technical due diligence. And normally most of them are not covered. So to describe it even broader, it's, it's like the six blind men that looking at an elephant and have to describe them to the king. So you only, the problem is you only have a limited amount of time and you will get not a complete picture. You only will see parts of the picture, and from that you have to, um, to trust your in, uh, intuitions and your experience about what you see and if it's really a weakness, or maybe it is a strength, but you only see limitations. Um, so what we have discovered after doing that a lot of times is 
it's a good way to visualize your findings. So what we do is um, we rank the things that we see and we try to group it inside um, a lot of areas. So we have this area engineering and organization, information security, operations, standards, software architecture and stuff like that. And what we do is with the, with the bigness of the circle, um, we try to show how um, important this aspect is. So it's more like the importance of the aspect. So we see in this company that we bought, information security has a big aspect, but yeah, they, they are really air in the, in the area of weakness. So they are not so... So this picture shows it's a startup. So most of the, of the things they do are really in the lower um, left case. But this helps to see, okay, where are their strengths, where are their weakness, so we see, okay, um, regarding of the software, and it was a software acquisition, we see, okay, they're really good, and the software itself has an importance, and that's the asset that we are buying. The second thing that we do is the risks that we find. We also group them in the same clusters. And so every risk that we find has a unique ID, and by the picture, you can find patterns. So, for example, if we see or most of the risk where green, green is operations, you can say, okay, it's a company, it has a lot of operational risks, so then let us source out the operations, so we reduce all the risks. In this picture, we see it's really a mix-up, so they have a lot of problems in different um, aspects, a lot of problems. Um, um, it's not really the real word because it's about 15 problems so, or 15 risks. It's no, not so much in a due diligence process because you will name up every risk that you, that you find or maybe could happen. Um, but this visualization helps a lot um, and helps a lot the upper management to, to get a view of um, what they should do. So how we get to this picture? Um, we have a lot of attributes that we take or consider during the due diligence. We have usage, development, operations, security, with all this kind of definitions below. Um, so these are our quality attributes that we rank in the, in the technical due diligence. But the problem is, in the due diligence, you have this visible or visible things that you see. You see the functionality of the software, you see pretty good if it will scale or if it won't scale, you see the costs and stuff like that. But the problems, what you won't see by only looking, um, is what's the underlying architecture of the software? What's about coupling of the software architecture? What's about the security? You can't see security by only looking at the product. What's about the coding practices? Is the code testable? Um, is it full covered? What's about the integration? Um, this times uh, multi-language supports is, uh, is a key aspect. So will it um, support a lot of languages? How reliable is it? How robust is it? So most of the aspects you can see by taking a, um, only a look about it. So you have to assess it. So what we are doing, and what's our approach is, we have this question form. So we have about 150 questions that we developed over the years. Um, so we putting question out, putting new question inside. We send these questions to our partner, and we tell them that he shouldn't have to fill them out by himself. So we send them to him to get to prepare him about what we will ask him. And afterwards, when we visit the partner, we do a workshop with him and we will fill out these questions with him together. Um, this helps us a lot to get the reaction. So um, by his reactions, how he answers the questions, um, we normally get new questions that we can ask him and we get new aspects that we may would have missed. So, Making this workshop with him um, helps a lot. We also include in this workshop um, a kind of um, threat modeling 
workshop that we do with him. So we use the Stride approach from the Microsoft development um, life cycle. So it's a very fast approach and you get a good um, insight about the architecture and the risks that may be inside the solutions. Um, so that's the workshop. Then we typically um, let them hand out the source code. The source code then we will scan with um, static code analysis tools, um, with software that calculates a lot of metrics. So we do that in parallel. And the extraction of all these small puzzles that we get during the workshop um, out of the code analysis, we do vulnerability scanning on his infrastructure to get a good feeling about how secure are their server systems, networks, and stuff like that. So we do that all automatically during the workshops. Um, this will re result in a report. The report then we also hand out to our partner for final review. This has the following reason. If he will see the report and he can review it, after we buy the company, he can't tell us, oh no, you have understood us, uh, you, you have understood that incorrect. We mean this in this and this way. So it's more like a safety measurement for, for us. Um, then we will hand out this report that the partner has seen and a second report. The second report is a smaller report. It's only a management report that also will contain um, stuff like how do we judge their skills. So it's more like soft judgments that we do not have any, let's say, proof for it. So it's only a feeling. We feel about this, this, and this stuff. So this also will be included only in the management report that the partner doesn't see. He sees all the technical aspects that we find, but all the soft aspects that are more based on intuitions and feelings, he won't see it. It's only a small extract. It contains uh, these two pictures that I showed you before and um, our feelings. So it's more like um, also our recommendation. Should they buy it or are there any technical reasons um, that should prevent them from buying the company? Yeah, so these are the two reports for them. The problem with software architecture, and there's also only the definition, um, is that a lot of those aspects you, you can't really, really measure, or it's, it's no real, this is the only way that you can measure reliability, performance, and stuff like that. So we had the company, it performed very well, but the moment that it has a large scale out, um, it won't perform any, any longer because there are sidestep, that there are bottlenecks, you haven't seen them before, um, or you, you couldn't have seen them before because you only have had a limited amount of time, and this will cause you a lot of problems. So think about um, these aspects, these are aspects that should be covered in good software and architecture, and at least they should tell you um, what they have done to um, improve them or to safeguard them. When we go to these companies, they often fear that we will only tell them that they have an ugly baby and that their code is, is shit and their application is shit and all what they do is shit. Um, and so the beginning of a technical due diligence most likely is about taking the fear from them, that you're not their enemy, you're only there to assess them, and maybe even if we don't buy them, um, they get this final report, so they will have like recommendation that we give them that they can consider or can't consider as much as they like, so they should see us as a free consulting firm that comes to them and help them. If we buy them, good. If we don't buy them, at least they get an insight or an external view on their business and maybe they can improve their business and quality by taking the recommendation. So what we see a lot during the due diligence are these aspects of software and architecture. So often we see the golden hammer approach. Uh, golden hammer is where they have one method 
and this is the golden method. So they use it for every aspect that they do. Our lava flow, um, we see their software code um, has evolved a lot. So it begins and then it contains dead code, functionalities that are no longer in use and so their code is, is not really maintainable any longer. We see wheel factories. Wheel factories is a software term where you always invent the wheel new. You don't use standards, you do it by your own. And we see that a lot of the time. They do their own search, they do their, their own authentication and a lot of stuff which is really also security important. So um, I have done in the last two years about 60 diligences and I haven't found one company that's used a standard authentication system. They all invented them by themselves with all the problems that it cause. We also see stove pipes. Um, so their software is only one monolith. You can't take any part of it out uh, without crashing the whole system. What I haven't seen is an internal platform. Internal platform is a term in the software architecture where you solve problems in a so generic way that the solution is only a copy of the platform that you use to solve the problem. And there's this term of gas factory. Um, haven't seen that also so much. It, yeah, but most of the time you see the golden hammer, lever flow really often and the wheel factory. So it's a combination of the first four parts that you see really often, at least in, in startups. So what are also problems in due diligence? Time frame is a big problem. So most of the time you only have one week or less to do a technical due diligence. So you only have limited amount of time to talk with the developers, talk with the sysadmins, talk with the business people there about technical aspects. Complexity is also a big problem since they use this wild mixture of technologies. So the startups typically experiment with so a lot of stuff. So they use code from here, code from there, code from there, mix them all together. So it becomes really hard to get a fair and clear judgment about how good their code really is. So it's a lot more problematic to evaluate code that contains PHP, Java, JavaScript, um, C++. Uh, architecture, for example, that we have seen is based on PHP, Java, C Sharp, built on an Apache system. And the Apache was running on a Windows 7 machine. Um, so it's, it's really... Um, eye-opening what you see and it makes a lot of problems judging um, the stuff or the whole architecture. Expect knowledge is also a problem, so when you are there, the right people most of the time is not available or it's in meetings or has other critical stuff that he has to do and so the time also where you can talk with persons who may be can answer your questions or the questions or the problems that you see um, is often really hard. Documentation, it's a problem, at least in startups. So even if they have documentation, it's most of the time not the, it's not documenting what you really see. It's so old, it's from the beginning, and then they have find out documentation won't help them, slow them down and stuff like that. So documentation most of the time uh, won't help you. Confidelity, it's this problem where they have the fear that if they tell you stuff, it may will raise or lower the price that you buy them uh, or that you will think about them um, as idiots and stuff like that. So confidelity is a problem that you can solve um, if you take the time in the, in the beginning. But the other problems if you only have one week time, um, you, you can't change anything there. Complexity, you have to deal with the, um, with the situation that you find. You also can change it. And the expert knowledge, um, if the person that had invented most of the things has gone from the company, you also can, can change that fact. So um, what we see is 
of course, they think about their baby or their application or their business as it's, it's a top solution and it's the best thing on the world. So what we do is we try to figure out if that's really the case and it's really good. And so we have the source code analysis and the matrix that we calculate. And after doing that a lot of time, we have yeah, automated a lot of stuff. So we called it our quality meter that give us a feeling um, about how good they are. So it's more like a temperature level. You haven't to overestimate that, but it gives you a feeling about um, if, if they are good or if they are not so good. And yeah, we do that with a lot of, of um, comparison to other companies that we have bought, where we also see after that was our feeling and our matrix that we have collected right, or have we um, to adjust them or maybe change them. Um, so these are also real, um, real world um, examples from our um, reports that we create, where you see if it's only one code, one monolithic, um, is it a lot of smaller services and stuff like that. You see, does the number of lines of code, for example, um, is it an average value or is it too low, too high, and stuff like that? Um, so what we also do there in the in the um, matrix. Um, aspect is that we use the uh, Kokomo model. The Kokomo model is a software model where you can try to estimate the value of the code. Um, so it generates a lot of matrix and by some magic at the end it calculates a value. So it's a, it's a, it's a model, you can, you can Google it. Um, you have to insert the number of lines um, the number of uh, functions and stuff like that, and then at the end it will calculate you um, a value of that software assets that you find there. And the cool thing about this, it will calculate it in a basic model, so you can compare PHP with Java, with JavaScript and stuff like that, so it has a factor that's included for all its languages and stuff like that, and it gives you a good um, a good feeling. Another thing that we um, I just have a look if I find it here. Um, yeah, the cyclomatic complexity. Um, it's also an aspect that we typically like to have a look at it because it typically says you how much is the complexity if you will add a new feature or change a, a feature or stuff like that. And if you have a cyclomatic complexity that's really high, there is an, um, a probability that you can calculate from it um, if it will fail or not um, doing changes. So what have we learned from making the technical due diligences? Sad, but uh, true, um, your report won't be read by anyone. Um, so we do a lot of reports, it's most of the time between 30 and 60 pages, and no one will read it. Even this management report that only contains five or six um, pages, no one will read it. Um, visualization helps, so um, this was an improvement that at least these two pictures, they take a look at them. Um, that's, that's true. They want concrete recommendations, so they don't only want this. Um, it's bad to do not have failover or fail safe systems. They want the recommendation. What should they do with the company after they buy it, so that they, um, before they buy it, at least have this um, page where they know what they must do and how much it will typically cost. Your report will be written and taken out by all of the people when the problem's popping out. Then all of the persons will take a look at your report and try to argument in political ways, either left side or right side. So when you write the report, you really have to keep that in mind. So every sentence that you write must be sharp. Um, 
the moment that you leave um, the possibility for interpretation in any of your phrase, they will use that against you. Um, so that's a real, real problem. But you say it um, and you tell it us um, it's so. And then you have um, to, to find a way out. So that's really a problem with due diligence because um, most of the time we're talking about a lot of money that's involved here. So what have we learned? Get a proper briefing about the aim of the acquisition. So before you go to the partner, get a proper briefing from your management. Is this a strategic buy? Do we buying the software? Do we buying the business model? What is the goal of the acquisition? If you don't do, uh, know the proper goal of the acquisition, you will get a lot of problems afterwards because you will write your report in a way about what you thought is the um, target of the acquisition. And afterwards, because it's unclear, so you also have to include that in your report, um, they will find ways. No, we told you before that that and that was the goal. So get the proper briefing. Um, communication. You are there to assess them, yeah, but you are not there um, to teach them. So talk on them on the eye level. So you are not their boss, neither their employees, so you are there to assess them. Um, do not only look for weaknesses. Most of the companies also have strengths, things that they are really good at. So that's, in my opinion, a general problem with security guys or technical guys. We only look at bad things. Um, and that's, yeah, prevents up prevents us from seeing good things. Because we only see the bad things and the insecurities and stuff like that, we um, tend to lose the good things. So um, in a due diligence, that's also really important. Scenarios, it's a big um, aspect. So when you know what's the target of the acquisition, you should keep that in mind. So maybe the, the target is that their business will scale factor 100. So does their software and their systems then also will work. So the future scenarios of use should be considered. Integration, do they use standards? Do they don't use any standards? Will that prevent you from your integration scenarios? Yes or no. Um, if they don't use web services or only have this one monolithic block, is it then possible to integrate them in your infrastructure? Yes or no. So that's really important. Findings. You should discuss your findings open with the partner. So tell them about what you find and what is his um, way of look about these findings. And as I talked before, um, let them review your report. It helps you a lot afterwards. Responsibility. Um, get the proper involvement of the partner by giving him the responsibility of reviewing your report, of delivering information and stuff like that. Analyze. You don't trust what they tell you. Most of the time they will tell you it's all secure, it's all documented, it's all really good, and yes, they have the new patch, uh, patches applied. Um, always use static code analysis and use vulnerability scanners. Um, for the application as well as the underlying infrastructure. It's really important. And you can do that in parallel while you are doing your interviews with them. Yeah, calculate matrix, but do not overestimate them. They only tend to give you a feeling or to strengthen your feeling um, if they're doing a good job or a bad job but do not overestimate them. We have seen companies with the matrix telling us everything is really fine, and by doing our analysis we found out it's not so fine. And we've seen companies where the matrix really were bad, but they are so good in business that we say, okay, even if the matrix are bad, but they are doing their business in the right way. Third party, as I also told you, it's a really big problem because they tend to use third-party software 
um, in a very creative way, um, and they tend to think that open source means you can use it in any way. But that, in legal aspects, tends to cause a lot of problems. If you, after acquisition, will um, have to be forced, for example, to make the source code public available, it's a big problem. Um, also look for outsourced skill. And finally, trust your intuitions and experience. Um, most of the time, your feeling is right. So, thank you for your attentions. Questions? Yeah. Yeah, can, the question was if, I, if we can um, hand out the questions that we, that we normally um, use. Yeah, we, we can apply them. It's only a starting set um, for the interviews, but yeah, we, we can hand them out. It's no problem. Yeah? Do you also have a sample report? No. <laughs> can you repeat the question? Uh, the question was if we have a sample report, um, and the answer is uh, no because um, it's really so a high amount of writing the report, we have no sample report, and giving you a real report would um, make too much public available that is confidential. Yeah? Um, the question was if we have seen any companies using OpenSAM or other maturity models. Um, the answer is no, because we typically only buy smaller companies, startups and stuff like that, so most of the companies has a size um, below 60 or 70 persons, so they are on the market most of the time only f till five years, and so they are really um, startup oriented and they don't care about measure regime models, unit testing and stuff like that. So I for myself haven't seen that. Any any other questions? Okay. Thank you very much for you. Thank you.